Some of the uh, more observant amongst you may have noticed that I forgot to turn the lights on in that last flight and uh, that's one of the perils of flying a plane that you're not really familiar with. Uh, so I, I apologise for that. It's um, one of the reasons why I didn't pick it up uh, as quickly as I should have done was that um, in fact it looked a lot darker on the YouTube uh, video than uh, it did actually on the screen. Um, but um, I've managed to um, uh, find the lights and I've, it, it basically I've been pressing L I don't think there is a, an internal light switch oh wait a minute no. didn't have lights turn on the internal lights look at that ok shift A shift A Let's get some. No, let's press S and get an, an external view. So just S and then uh, A. I'm trying to look for the top down. That's it. So if I press plus, which is basically e, the equal sign on the main keyboard, I'll, I can see where I am. Um, and that's useful uh, when you don't have a, a map. So I'm pretty much where we landed last time. What I'm going to do is. Also, the, the other thing I think I did, which was a bit unfair, was I um, I sort of pulled rank on you by having a book, of, a directory of airfields. And I think that's, you know, and, th and this is really, this is not sort of flying on a shoestring, but this is, I'm trying to um, make use of FSX and now to, apart from the VFR scenery, which is the only scenery I've paid for, uh, there are only other two add-ons, are a pencil and paper. So I'm going to show you how you can get much, much more information out of the GPS because although we did use the GPS last time, we sort of only scratched the surface of what it can do, really just coupling it to the autopilot. So this is going to be a little bit less about how to fly the plane and a bit more about um, how to um, use the GPS. So let's taxi to uh, the, it looks like 04 there, so we're going to be taking off to the southwest. So the reciprocal of 04. Um, 04 means that the runway is angled at about 40 degrees 040 because they dropped the last zero. And it can be 5 degrees either way if you think about it because it could be like 44 degrees and still be runway 4, or it could be 36 degrees and still be runway 4. Anyway, the opposite runway, if you add on 180 to 40, is 220. So that'll be runway 22. So I'm going to taxi for departure runway 22. And we're going to do that by doing an about turn and then taking the and coming back down here and then and taxiing up here, which I think actually will probably only take me if I zoom out a bit. Yeah, it'll take me. It'll take me straight onto the runway, but I'll just have to backtrack up the runway. So S, S, and we're back in the cockpit. Now um, we're going to go to uh, South End, and I haven't done a flight plan for it, and I'll tell you why in a minute, because we're going to just make use of the GPS to get us to where we need to go. And this is really going to be about uh, flying on the GPS, if that's what you want to do. Also, I'm going to um, zoom in a bit more, because I think it's just easier to read the instruments if we do. So we've got the engine running, we've got the mixtures, red mixtures rich and the blue prop pitch fine. Uh, obviously we need to check fuel, so let me just check everything's fine because even with these, we've got the booster pump on, we've got the elevator trim on, trim on. there's no, no piece of heat prop ice and we don't need the standby vacuum. Um, but we need to look at fuel because obviously we need to make sure we've got enough fuel for the trip. And I'm going to be flying at about 5,000 feet for this, and that's really just because it's an, it's an arbitrary height. Um, we'll try not to bust any airspace. I'll, I'll stay well north of the London airports. Otherwise, everything looks fine. So yeah, there's no reason why it makes one both. So let's uh, give it a little blip and which way's the best way to turn around? Can you guess? turn left don't we pilot sits on the left so the best view we've got is the left hand view which is basically the left hand wing and uh, when you're turning around in a plane you absolutely need to be 
um, wary of the wingtip. Now don't worry if you can't see too much outside the cockpit because we're going to have our heads inside the cockpit for this uh, this flight. There's um, a British Airways um, 747. Didn't watch his wingtips, did he, recently? Well... Stop, 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 stop. End of taxiway. Taxi mistake. Parking brakes on. Control full stop. S. Plus, plus, plus. Where, where are we? <laughs> I haven't done exactly what I thought I was going to do. That's very strange. I'm just going to have to turn around and go back. Now look, this is interesting because here we've got a real life situation where there's probably not enough room to turn around. I could, I might be able to do that on the brakes, but possibly not. Thought I didn't go off the tarmac anyway. And what you would do in real life is you would um, shut the plane down and you would get out of the plane and manipulate it, hand turn it. In other words, you go to the tip of the wing or the, the uh, side of the uh, tail and push and literally just push the plane around, making sure that you haven't left the brakes on. Um, if this happens to you, you can simulate that by pressing Y, which puts you into slew mode and literally um, rotating the rudder. So press the rudder and um, I'm just going to move myself forward a bit and then that puts me in the situation that I would be in if I'd, if I'd manipulated the plane and, and turned the plane around. So it's cheating a bit but um, that's in practice that's what you would do in real life. So let's take the parking brakes off and have another go. Uh, you can taxi from the overhead view it's not very realistic but as I say um, there's no um, well, you can get add-ons, obviously, that give you all this. Um, press Shift S and S again. That give you all the uh, airport plans and stuff like that. But, uh, and that's why you need an up-to-date manual. You know, if you're flying in the real world, you have to change your manual every year because these uh, airports are constantly changing their taxiways and what they call their taxiways. Right, so we're going again. So now the prize for the first person who can work out how to get to the runway in the dark can't even see the runway oh I went straight on and I missed the left turning didn't I yeah I need to go up here and then turn right and then turn left I meant to go round and turn left and left again and in fact I, I missed this left turning it's not that difficult to do if you think about it. The, um, you know, in fact, I think it's there. So, let's follow the signs. We're going up Foxtrot, taxiway Foxtrot, and then up taxiway Echo. Speed things up a bit. There are two schools of thought on taxiing. Everyone will tell you you need to taxi at walking pace. But that's not everybody agrees on that. In fact, uh, you'll find quite a few um, private pilots who taxi at a very brisk rate. And amongst them, one or two who've literally written their planes off <laughs> because they've, they've taxied them and without realizing that uh, the wind was also having a considerable effect on the plane and uh, end up tipping them up. In practice a plane won't tip up in wind. It'd be a bit, bit of a disaster if they did, wouldn't it? Um, what are we doing? We're crossing 1836, yes. I think they're, they're not licensed for use after dark 1836. You can use them, obviously you can use them. Now I'm going to stop 
Right, we're crossing 1836, yeah, that's fair enough. 1836 is this unlit runway that's going, going across here, can you see it? You can see 36. And you can see there's got an X on it, and there's an X down here. An X on a runway means you mustn't land on it. So it's obviously an old runway that's where it's been discontinued. It, it, it might be used in an emergency. You know, if you if you literally had a fire on board or something and you just needed to get on the ground as soon as possible, you could possibly use it. And a large number of them are perfectly serviceable to light aircraft, um, especially ones that are used to short field landings. Uh, people who fly in and out of grass airstrips and stuff like that could easily land on one. But the problem with these uh, runways that are unserviceable, and you see that you can see these X's here. Um, is, is what are all these other things here and quite a number of airfields um, take make use of the hard standing by putting um, light industrial units building light industrial units and um, so as a result you can land and, and and come across anything from a machine shop to a Sunday morning boot fair <laughs> on, the, on an unused runway so in general it's not encouraged, except in extremis. In extremis you can do anything in a plane, literally, anything. A lot of pilots, when they're thinking of emergency landings, and emergency landings is something that we'll, um, we may cover at a later date, will say, well, if I need to land, I'll land on a road, because a road does very much resemble a runway and there are instances of uh, people who have landed on um, unfinished bypasses and things like that and assuming that they were runways um, but in general roads are poor landing strips they're nice from the point of view that they are tarmac um, but they're poor from the point of view of that they're almost always curved and it's almost impossible to control a plane that's coming in on final approach and drive it round a corner. You can't land on a banana shaped uh, runway. And the other thing is there's a lot of street furniture obviously with um, runways. You know they've got all sorts of stuff all over them. Not, not in the middle obviously but well in the middle you, you may have a central reservation if it's dual carriageway and then towards the outside you've got all sorts of lap posts and signs and stuff like that and uh, they have been known to catch the uh, the wings of planes uh, if you drift sideways um, so really you're better off with a big old field right so I said we we're going to South End didn't we now um, this is not going to be a totally realistic flight but this is a demonstration flight obviously so what I've done is I've got the old GPS up here and I've completely magnified it and um, we're going to go to South End, and South End is Echo Golf Mike Charlie. So I'll show you, I've already got that in, and I'll show you how I did that. You just press this button here with the arrow and the D, and it's a direct to facility. And what you can do is if you um, uh, press the small right arrow, let's put something in, let's just enter that. Right, I've I've and I've activated a, a a route to point A, wherever point A is in the world. It's uh, over 1,200 nautical miles away, but the the point is really I've just cleared out Echo Golf Mike Charlie. So let's just to show you how we put it in. So you can see it's flashing, and we press the right arrow once, and then press the right arrow again, which is what catches most people out and I'm going to go to E and then press the large arrow to take you to the next space and then click right until you get to G now at this point it's going through all of the E's and all of the G's as you get to the third digit there are fewer options because everything that comes up now has to begin EG so you'll find it's skipping um, skipping numbers and it, and uh, eventually it starts to skip letters so let's just put in M Mike 
there we are and the last digit is goes A and it goes straight to C because there is no Echo Golf Mike Bravo so South End and press enter and that confirms Echo Golf Mike Charlie in that field now you press enter again to take you down to the activate and then press enter again and then that puts in Echo Golf Mike Charlie as your destination and now you notice it draws a direct route so it's it's really um, designed to take you somewhere in an emergency you know normally you would use a flight plan but let's say that um, you have to go to your diversion airport or you have to land in an emergency and you just need to find the nearest airport uh, and we'll show you that in a minute um, you'll you can use the direct to literally just to brute force your way to absolutely any point that's in the database and it doesn't take any account of airspace or anything it'll just take you in a direct line and also there's only you can only do this for one point so you can't say I want to go direct to South End via Manston it, it won't do that it just takes you to one point there's one point in the database and if you put in a second point it just completely clears out the first point so it's more it's, a, it's an emergency thing and also if you find yourself in the air and you're a bit lost or if you find yourself in the air and you haven't done a treatment plan you can in flight simulator you can quit out and just formulate a treatment plan and file it in mid-air if you like um, providing you don't when it says do you wish to move your airport to the um, start of the treatment the, the flight plan just say no otherwise you'll end up on the ground at the airport you've listed as your departure airfield. So here we, we've just got it um, straight in as uh, Mike Charlie. So I'm going to uh, just decrease the range a bit, zoom in a bit and see and see what's in the way. There's not too much in the way, is there? I can't really see the airspace on this. There's um, Stansted here. There's uh, that looks like Luton there. I don't really want to fly through all this airspace so what I'm going to do is I'm going to fly I'm going to fly around this way um, so at the moment we're heading uh, uh, 2-1 so in order to avoid, uh, avoid this airspace I'm going to turn right and then I'm literally going to head in the opposite direction so uh, the opposite direction is 2-1 is 0 3 zero. So, and we're not, so we're not heading for south end at the moment shift 3 get rid of that so we're going to turn right now if we um, zoom in on the heading bug I'm going to put the heading bug 030 but we want to do a right turn now if I put it on exactly the opposite which I said I wanted to do and then engage the autopilot there's a 50% chance the autopilot will turn left and I definitely don't want it to turn left, I want it to turn right so in order to turn right onto a heading the heading bug has to be in the right hand half and then it will turn right um, and in fact if you want to turn, supposing you want to turn right onto a heading of 060 well, where it would naturally turn left what you have to do it in two st 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 uh, steps, you have to turn right onto 345 or something and then as the plane comes around, once it's gone through about 90 degrees then when the 060 comes into the right hemisphere then you put 060 so I'm going to say I'm going to say turn onto a heading of north um, to start off with okay now we're going to be um, initially uh, 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 steering with the um, heading bug so in fact and then eventually with the GPS so at the moment this doesn't really matter but eventually we're going to use the GPS so I'll um, put that onto GPS and because we're steering with the heading bug this is what you'll need to press to get it to steer with the heading bug um, but you don't want that pressed when you take off otherwise it will it will immediately start to try and follow the heading bug and uh, really you don't want any interference from the autopilot at all when you take off as far as altitude goes uh, 4000 feet is fine and we'll, we'll tell it we, we want it to manage the altitude is put in a, a climb rate of 700 feet per minute which is fine so that's doing the vertical navigation for us we're going to handle the lateral navigation and uh, eventually when um, 
we are happy for it to handle the lateral navigation. We'll um, press the heading button and it will start st steering on the bug. So that all sounds a bit more complicated than it, than it really is. So let's get in the air. I'll just check if we've got any flaps. We haven't got any flaps, but again, it's a nice long runway. So let's get in the air. I'm just going to... Uh, I'm not going to do the run-ups. We'll just check everything's fine. I'm happy. Hold it on the brakes. Throttle up. Check the T's and P's and pressures and everything. The engine sounds fine. So off the brakes. Tally ho, tally ho. It's good that you can hear the sort of the sound of the uh, wheel on the tarmac there. That's very realistic. Just keeping it straight. We're about 80 knots now, so I'm just pulling back a little bit just to keep it on the main wheels but take the weight off the nose wheel and now it's climbing so we pull the nose back and keep it within the white arm for a couple of seconds don't climb too fast gear up because we're um, no intention of coming round coming down and I'm going to maintain about uh, 110 knots and uh, whatever rate of climb that gives us you can see we're turning around nicely now so what I'm going to show you what happens now if we engage the autopilot that's now going to maintain you'll see that in the up down meter this will go down to 700 feet which is what we're expecting uh, given the setting and if I click on the heading bug the plane will enter a, a 30 degree right turn which is a, what they call a standard turn to the right and uh, see the speeds creeping up there and that's because that's actually quite a shallow climb so you can either have a 700 feet per minute climb and a bit of extra speed or if you want to climb as fast as possible put it in something like um, a 1200 a 1200 feet per minute climb and then um, you'll find that your your speed will start to drop off So you see it's pretty quickly gone up to a 1,200 feet per minute climb, hasn't it? And we're still fast, look, we're still going too fast. I'm going to press B to um, coordinate the barometer and D for the DI. Now at this point we're not really worried about the yellow um, pointer or anything. We're literally, it's just literally brute forcing it on the heading bar. And we said we wanted to go 030, so I'm going to turn that round to 030 now, and that'll take us the final 30 degrees. We're still climbing like a rocket. We're doing 130 knots, even though we're climbing at 1,200 feet a minute. We could probably climb faster. Go, let's put it up to 1,800 feet a minute, which is a phenomenal rate of climb. Let's see what happens. there we are look that's just come back down to the most efficient climb speed so next time we want to climb probably probably I think 1500 probably a bit better um, next time we want to climb when it suggests 700 feet a minute we can say 700 1500 we're coming up to our uh, set altitude of 4000 so you can see it's coming up here and what it's doing now, we're not climbing at 1500 feet anymore, it's levelling off. And this is what autopilots do so brilliantly for you. It's levelling off at 4000 and we're absolutely spot on. So we're spot on heading, we're spot on altitude. The uh, speed's climbing now because we've levelled off. We're still at full throttle so we have to watch out. But we want, we want to speed up. So I'm going to let it speed up and then when I'm happy that we're at a reasonably good cruise speed. I'm going to drop the manifold pressure. And remember on a constant speed prop, what you adjust is the manifold pressure. You don't adjust the um, the uh, RPM. The RPM is pretty well determined by the how coarse the prop is. So at the moment, we've accelerated up in what is effectively first gear. 
So I'm going to pull the prop out a bit. If you watch the RPM, you'll find it will drop down to the towards the middle of the green uh, range. And that's effectively changing up the gear. So we're now in second gear. And still, how fast we go is still going to depend on the manifold pressure. And there's not really a, a range for that. But there, there would be a range at which you would, you would know how to um, fly the plane. In fact, if we press uh, sh is it a shift, F shift F10, shift F10, yeah, and look at in the reference, um, we may, yeah, this is the problem you see. We've got speeds, haven't we? We've got a cruising, let's see if we can find a cruising speed. There's a maximum structural cruising speed of 174 knots, um, but that's not really um, what we want. Maneuvering speed is, uh, there are three maneuvering speeds depending on our, our weight. Um, the maneuvering speed is basically if you're in rough air and you need you need to be changing direction then you have to fly at a certain speed which gives you like a quite a big safety margin in terms of you uh, in case you get caught by a gust of wind and this is in strong winds where you might have winds gusting 45 knots so you might be uh, you might have all of a sudden you might have a 45 knot tailwind and then you will go to a 45 knot headwind and under those circumstances you have to make sure that you don't structurally overstress the plane um, so the reason, and so, so what we do is, um, uh, and you can see that the lighter the plane, actually the slower the um, safe manoeuvring speed. The maximum structural cruising speed is really as fast as you can push it in still air. That's if you're trying to get somewhere really quickly, um, uh, just to, you know, and you're a bit of a daredevil and it tells you roughly how, how hard you can push it. And you've got about a 20 knot safety margin there because the never exceed speed is 195. Now if you end up between these two speeds you will have got there by stupidity or mistake because um, and that's that's literally your last bit of safety margin there. If you find yourself doing 185 knots you're going faster, you, you, you're in severe danger if you hit a bit of turbulence or make a turn or something or have to pull out of a, a dive of taking the wings off. 195 literally is um, goodbye you know and then a maximum gear extension speed is fairly self-explanatory 165 knots the stalling speed is at maximum weight with the flaps up so in other words in the worst possible condition of, of uh, all your mates in all your golf clubs and absolutely no and, and the minimum wing area so that's uh, 66 knots which is which is fantastic really if you think about it isn't it it'll fly at uh, 170 knots and and carry on flying right the way down to less than 70 knots if you're in the landing configuration which is with your wheels down and maximum flaps then you can expect to fall out of the sky if you go down below 60. now your best angle of climb speed and the best rate of climb we've said that you can usually get those from the white uh, dial so we've got uh, 80 85 90 95 100 105 110 I suppose um, so top of the white arc good indicator of climb speed in fact it's slightly less it's 105 the difference between these two speeds is uh, supposing you are flying into a mountain you are not going to be worried about how fast you climb you're just going to be worried about how steeply you can climb you don't mind climbing slowly, providing you're going straight up, do you? So uh, that, uh, those you would use your best angle of climb. So the best angle of climb is generally calculated for obstacle avoidance. Um, so, for example, if you're in a on an airstrip where there's a big and it's in a forest and you've got trees at either end, you have to really um, climb at your best angle of climb until you're clear of the trees, and then you can. Um, flatten off a bit and go up at your best rate of climb. Then the glide speed uh, is, uh, you've got speeds there for various uh, weights and we're, this is the sort of the emergency figure you keep in your head for engine failure. So supposing the engine packs up we've got about uh, something like 90 knots 
so it's pretty um, you know it's we're somewhere between 80 and 90 it's no easy way to remember that but um, See how the um, you can change the temperature dial at the top there, and it um, yeah changes the airspeed. Um, that's because uh, air density changes with um, temperature. So if we're going to glide to a landing, by the time we do our mayday and everything, all the time we're doing our mayday, we're thinking 90 degrees. And uh, if you go faster than 90 you will land sooner and if you go slower than 90 you will land sooner and a lot of pilots don't actually remember that uh, and they try and go slower than 90 and end up not going as far as uh, you know stretch the glide out and they end up not going as far as they would have done so we're we're pretty well uh, well set up aren't we um, let's just uh, go back to the GPS now and see where we are. I think we're well clear of any airspace, so we can afford to turn right and head over to South End. So I'm going to put the heading bug over to the right here on 120 degrees, and we're going into our standard turn. Now, sort of, is it 25 degree, 30 degree turn? see we're not losing any height here again which is marvellous now a 30 you can see a 30 degree turn is pretty pretty quick turn isn't it this is not the sort of turn you get on your standard uh, jet uh, well in fact it is funnily enough <laughs> that's why it's called the standard turn it's the turn which would take you to it's a two minute turn and uh, if we turn I guess we're mucking about let's just turn back the other way again if you look at this turn coordinator, which you might think has got something to do with turns, you'll notice two things. First of all is that the wing lines up perfectly with this marker. And in the event that this, uh, your primary flight display, your attitude indicator is unserviceable or US, you would need to use this to gauge a two minute turn. And it's got two minutes on here because that's two minutes is precisely how long it would take to go right the way round in a circle and you think that actually that's not um, you know you wouldn't think it would take you two minutes if I had two minutes I would take the time to show you that it, it is true you can see there it's going to the other right the other thing is the ball is perfectly in the centre because the uh, we're not skidding because um, the plane is managing the rudder perfectly so everyone's nice and comfortable and not, not like on a fairground ride being slung outside of the plane they're being pushed down vertically in their seats during the turn because the uh, uh, the rudders being worked with the ailerons to keep the centre of gravity acting vertically downwards through the um, the plane and through the passengers. Now it says no pitch information and pitch is the uh, going down and up and that's because unlike the attitude indicator it does give you pitch information whereas this one doesn't. This is fixed around a pivot here so if you're plummeting to the ground, this won't move up and down to show you that you're plummeting to the ground. It says DC electric to remind you that it's working on an electric circuit, which is different, totally different and entirely separate from the gyroscope and suction system that's working the, um, the, the attitude indicator here. Good. And yes, in two minute time. So that tells you all about that. And that's that's a secondary instrument that really doesn't come into play much uh, unless um, you have a failure. And later on, we may well have failures. Sorry about that. I had to have a sneeze. Now, now would be a good time to do a Frida check. So we'll just check and see how we're doing with the fuel. We've got two tanks, pretty equal. That's good. The radio, well, we're navigating by uh, using the GPS and everything. We're not using the comms boxes or the navs boxes at the moment. 
the engine is fine the amps is pretty well on zero if if we had an alternator failure and the alternator master switch is here let's now I always like to try and make sure that um, we're careful which switches to push but I can turn the alternators off and there you can see immediately that that amps is discharging what that means is all this electricity and all the sparks to the um, all the sparks to the spark plugs and everything is now now coming out of the battery and that's that's a bit of a nightmare isn't it because um, um, eventually things are going to start going dim and going off and you've got a warning there you see can you see there the low uh, voltage on the left alternator there and, and it should really say the right alternator but I don't think we can turn these off separately um, yeah so if you that that's a bad indicator if you're when you're looking around you need to know what's good and what's bad don't you so that's a bad indicator wouldn't recommend you do this in flight. the actually the engine wouldn't stop believe it or not because the um, spark for the spark plugs is generated by the engine and this is another safety feature so f even if the battery went flat and all the lights went out the engine wouldn't stop because basically the engine in running uh, generates its own electricity so it generates every time it um, fires it generates a spark which it then uses for its next cycle so it's pretty self-contained so it's uh, you know it's quite difficult to um, stop a plane flying so the fuel pressure is is fine um, what what we can do we don't need the taxi light on or the landing lights the rest of those we do need on but we don't need the fuel pump on so if I do what I hate and just put that on I'll turn the booster pump off I think that's the only place you can do that you can probably see it down here but um, no it's probably I don't like moving the trim yeah you could yeah you can do it from here but I don't like moving the the oak uh, as I say, because of the fact that it disconnects the alternator. Well. Now you you see a thing down here called cowl flaps, and you can open and close the cowl flaps. I think you can if you uh, click and drag it. There we are. It's a bit quick. And the cowl flaps are a bit like opening the bonnet on the engine. And the reason that uh, this plane has got cowl flaps is it's got a very powerful engine and the reason why you might need to open them was uh, supposing you were climbing so by definition you're going slow um, you're giving the engine everything it's got so the engine's about as hot as it's going to get um, and it's going to start to overheat and so what you do is you open the, the bonnet and this is what the cow flaps are doing so it's all to do with temperature management um, in most uh, air flight simulator planes it doesn't really matter uh, I think in the B-17 Flying Fortress it's very important because those engines are always blowing up because they overheat. Um, but that's what that is, so on a very hot day you can sort of simulate uh, sim uh, simulate cooling down the engine by opening the cowl flaps and then you have to close them again when you, 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 you're in the cruise. So let's go straight to Mike Charlie. So direct. Now it's already selected, so all I need to do now is press enter, enter, and it's replanned my route. And you can see here we're immediately moving off the route because it doesn't, it, unlike a car GPS, which constantly replans the best way for you to get where you want to go, this plans it once from the spot you are at and you can see we've already flown past that spot uh, there's Cambridge down there um, so what you can do you can <laughs> you can carry on doing it again so there we are brought it forwards but um, the best thing to do is just to uh, make sure that your GPS your nav GPS is on GPS and then uh, press nav and it will cease to follow the heading bug and start to navigate um, according to the source that you've given it and the source that we've told it to go 
by is the GPS. So this nav here is navigating according to this source and it's confusing because this says nav as well but this nav here refers to these navs here nav 1 and nav 2 the navigation uh, boxes that work off the uh, VHF omnidirectional range finders or the VORs uh, and we we are going to use those a bit later on so you can see from this here that we've uh, as I as I showed on the GPS we've we've flown past the GPS line that we need to be on um, you can see here that we're left of it we're left of it by about a mile and, and closing this is a bit confusing the cross track box because uh, that symbol there is telling you which way to steer it's it's not telling you that you're nearly a nautical mile off the track to the right it's telling you that the track is nearly a mile to your right so you need to do what it's telling you here it's telling you to steer right and that's what the plane is doing naturally the autopilot's doing and it's also telling us that we're 42 miles away from south end and we'll be there in about 15 minutes now this is where i'm going to set right some, something else i did wrong last time which is to just to show you how to get the information about an airfield that you're landing at so let's see what we can find out about south end so um, I'm just a, it's only superstition but I always start off by clearing stuff and here remember I said that we can navigate with either the um, the course north or the plane north but there are other screens as well so if I press the large right arrow this is taking us to um, a series of screens which give us information about the various uh, uh, VORs, NDBs and uh, intersections, airports and the one that's in at the moment is Hatfield. So the way that you change that, if you push the cursor it makes the uh, selection box active and then I think if you, let's just get this right that's it and then, and then I think that's it if you press the right small right hand arrow once again we're in the situation where we can enter the ICAO code for the airport that we're interested in and in this case it's South End Echo Golf Mike Charlie now you might say well that's you know if it's Derek you're still not being completely straight with us because how do we know it's even Echo Golf Mike Charlie and that's a good point so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to aircraft world map which is alt w m and that that will pause the simulation and this um, really approximates the maps and charts and books that you would have as a pilot um, and although it's designed to be used more in the pre-planning um, you can use it to find out information that you need in in the air so let's zoom right in on where we want to go to so here's where we want to go to so let's just turn turn things off let's turn off as much as we can now we're literally down to a runway there but if we uh, put the cursor on it it will come up and tell us the ICAO indicator for the runway south end that it's 49 feet above mean sea level is 6,000 feet long the control tower is um, 127 decimal 725 now all we need out of that is the echo golf mic charlie it's also got a uh, an end a non-directional beacon on it can you see that 362 decimal 5 so using our add-on pencil let's put 362 decimal 5 in it's also got an ILS and if we hover over that it will give us the ILS details so it's ILS for runway 24 the Morse code ident is IND that's what we're looking for let's just get this 
it's an uh, the ILS the angle is actually 236 although it's 24 it's been rounded up it keeps timing out the information and it's on 111.35 okay now that's all the information that you'd have um, you, you can get in the plea in the planning phase and in many ways that's better than having a pilot's book because um, it's accurate in other words it fits with the, the uh, flight simulator database we're actually pretty well um, coming back on course here remember I said it doesn't matter where this is pointing always tend to keep it pointing up so I can uh, just remind myself that's the direction we're flying although the direction we're flying is always pointing up and then always keep the heading heading thing here as well and that's as I say the reason is that if for any reason we needed to disengage the autopilot quickly we can just fly on the heading bug and brute force changes of direction and that we might need that when we're approaching an airfield and we might be starting to get vectors and we would then do everything on the heading bug so we were let's have a look at the GPS so that's how I found out that it was Echo Golf Mike Hotel so let's press the large right arrow to move along and then the small left arrow to go down to the M large right and then small right to get there and then press enter now if that's entered we should be able to move between the pages shouldn't we oh, let's just enter it again so let's press enter and then if we use the small arrows we can now get the same information that we had from the, the map the, the planning map so here it's giving us uh, an excellent uh, summary of what, what it's all about. 5933 feet, uh, control tower, ATIS information, height above sea level, etc, etc. I don't know why it says 3000 feet there. Something you can do which not many people know is you can actually zoom in and zoom out on these. And that's particularly with the uh, procedures, the arrivals is um, necessary to make things um, easier it's an asphalt service and it's open 24 hours so uh, we go to the next page by clicking the small right arrow and it's giving us all the frequencies which is brilliant including the the ILS frequency which is the one that we're going to need for landing and here are all the approaches and this is the ILS approach to runway 24 and if you're coming in on a flight plan and you want to go jump from your flight plan to the landing pattern the transition the way that you do it is by being vectored by air traffic control but we don't have any air traffic control at the moment now um, we're, these are sort of local intersections and NDBs and things so it gets a bit meaningless after that but uh, we've got all the information that we need don't we about uh, Mike Charlie so let's press an enter clear and see how we're doing put the range up now it's taking us straight into Mike Charlie but what we need to do really is um, steer slightly to the left here and then come in down the funnel so the other thing I'm going to do if we just um, shift 3 to clear the um, GPS is I'm just going to put it back on the bug by pressing heading you see you'll get a little shift of uh, adjustment there and I'm going to tell it to turn left in other words I'm deliberately going to t take us off course so we're not heading towards south end anymore we're just heading out into random space and the reason is that we're going to use that NDB frequency to help us find south end now NDBs really are an ancient technology that even predate VOR and they're very very basic um, and basically they are just a, a, a radio transmitter that transmits equally in all directions so it doesn't give you any information about how far away you are from it uh, or what your bearing is it just basically you tune into it and your plane will then tell you what direct, where it is in other words how to fly towards it 
So, and this is the, the mystery box here that we haven't used so far, the ADF box. And the frequency, which if you've written it down, is was 362.5. So let's put that in. two decimal five there's one decimal place involved in this now where on earth do we find that and that's the answer is this dial here it's another mystery dial which seems to have no purpose at all and this is the ADF dial and this indicator is slaved to this box here now I suspect that South End is somewhere south. And in fact, um, what I'm doing now is I'm relying on a, um, an ADF that we can't really even pick up yet to get us. So I'm, I'm hoping we're going to pick it up as we get closer to it. So we're not steering on the, the, the autopilot is steering in terms of altitude and on the heading boat. Um, but we're not using the GPS now for steering and we're not using the VOR steering. Now, when we pick it up, it's going to make a noise. So if we press the ADF button, then as soon as the Morse code for the South End NDB comes on, oh. now we've got dot dot dot, which I know is S, and dash dot dot, which is D. Let's wait for and dash dot in the middle, which is N. So now I know that the ADF has picked up South End. Don't need to do that anymore. Now, how can we check that? Well, if that is really pointing towards the South End NDB, then if we change our direction, then that should change, shouldn't it? So let's change the direction and see if this moves at all. It's not looking promising, is it? Probably because we're looking at the wrong thing. <laughs> this will be the ADF then. Now, you see this is on north. And in fact, you can you can change this. This is as I say, this is very basic technology. I've to I've turned on to south because I know I've got to turn right. Here we've got north and south pretty well aligned now. All I know is I need to turn further right. So I'm going to put the heading bug a little bit further around to the right. And I know that when um, this is going straight up. What is that then? That must be something. Oh, that must be the second VOR. Okay, I told you I don't fly this plane regularly. It's even further right, even further right, even further right. There we are, that's fine. So now, I'm happy now, we're flying straight towards South End. Now, what you can now do is you can align the, um, the rotating bezel now with the compass. There we are. It won't change, but at least when you're looking at this instrument until such time as you turn, it will tell you roughly what direction you're heading in. I don't know how much use that is. Probably on a long bomber run, probably more use than it is to us now. Now, the, we don't, what we don't do is we don't have any idea of um, how far away we are. Because the DME equipment only works on the, the VHF omnidirectional range finders, which is the VORs, and we're not tuned into one of those yet. And we, we're not, we don't intend to. What we do intend to tune into is the instrument landing system. And that's not GPS based, it works on the nav. So I'm going to switch over to nav to make sure that the um, autopilot's got the correct inputs when we come into land. Also I'm going to slow down slightly and I'm going to um, descend to about 2500 feet. So we'll have to do that with m making sure that we don't overspeed. But that seems to be coming down pretty well. 
Now what now how can we navigate our way into the runway? We know the runway is 28. We know that the ILS is 11135. So how do we navigate our way into the funnel? Well if the runway is 28, here's our compass. We know we know that we're going to be flying this way. So we're going to be turning right, aren't we? Into it. So in order to turn right and fly down the ILS, we're going to need to position ourselves to the left of the airport. As we're coming towards it, we need to steer left so that at the last minute we can turn right and fly down the ILS. So really, we need to have this arrow pointing to the right. So I'm going to turn the heading to the left. See the nav's come up because we've um, it's showing us that it's not getting any useful information. It's still acting as a compass. Now if you think about it, when we are flying, just imagine, when we're flying down the ILS, this is still going to be pointing direct towards South End. And therefore it's going to need to be pointing about uh, 280, isn't it? So in fact when we're lined up with the ILS, this would, would be pointing pretty much 10 degrees north of west, 280. I'm going to slow down a bit more because um, I said it was a slippery aircraft and we're coming in very hot. Let's just... Um, we've, we've finished with um, having the propeller course now. We want the propeller fine. We're shifting back into first gear because we're going to do a lot of manoeuvring at uh, first gear speeds. And you can see as south end slips by on our right hand side, this arrow is in fact uh, increasing. And the time to turn towards South End will be pretty much when this goes to the west. We can turn, and but by the time we've turned, it'll probably be um, we'll be flying down the ILS. So that's the old-fashioned way of uh, doing things. Now we're we're down to about 2,500, and the speed's dropping nicely. So I'm going to leave that. And lastly, we need to set up the ILS approach and the frequency for that was 11135 so 11135 let's put that on there and then we're going to do the ident which was I I N D, wasn't it I I think is two dots N we know is a that's it, a dash and a dot and then a dash and two dots so we'll hear that one more time Keep an eye on this. See, it's about time to start turning right, isn't it? That's it. Two dots, dash and two dots. Oh, dash and a dot, dash and two dots, sorry. So now we can turn that off. We're in the flat uh, range now, so I don't want to get too much slower than that, so I'll just throttle up a little bit. We don't know how far we are away from South End. You see, that's the trouble. We could be uh, 10 miles away. We could be 80 miles away. What we do know is we're below the glide slope because you see these triangles here. They're they're at the top, and that's good because remember you can't glide, you can't dive down. Let me just turn this round because we're pretty well there now. What we needed to have done was to turn this round to the direction of the runway 28 just missed intercepting the glide slope there so I'm going to go past it the best place for the um, bug heading bug when you're trying to intercept a, a localizer is in the gap between the arrow head and the arrow shaft and that's just starting to come back nicely so I'm going to put it just to juggle around with it a bit we're still below the glide slope so we're actually you know we're okay I, I'm, we're oversteering a bit here comes the glide slope the glide slope's coming down I'm 
going to drop the F7 first degree of flaps. We may be closer than we think because it's going around so much. I'm going to click on APR and get the computers the uh, the um, hello. Well, that's it's done a rather extreme course correction there, hasn't it? It's taken it almost 90 degrees off. But I mean, um, I'm going to I'm going to keep some faith in it and just let see if it can correct. You have to keep an eye on the height though, because um, we are now because it's intercepted the glide slope, it has initiated a descent, and we're down to 2,200 feet. Which if I press B, uh, just to reset the um, regional Q and H. So we're we're pretty well on. Ah, uh, uh, it's because it's 22. It's runway 22. It's not runway 28 at all. 28 is Manston. You may ask how I stayed along so live as a pilot, and uh, that would be a very good question. Uh, alive or even alive so long. So now it all starts to make sense. Here we're heading up to um, South End. Here we are acquiring the guy slope for one way to do. Trust the instruments. Uh, in other words, let the uh, autopilot get you out of your incompetence. And there's the runway. So I'm going to need to slow down a little bit more. We're in the flap deployment zone, so we're going to deploy the um, sessions stage of the flaps and um, pop the gear down. And shift F5 will put the um, landing light on. And we sh well, you know we can by rights so put the booster pump on. If I could see the booster pump. There we are, without killing us all. Right, so that's it, and there's South End. So what have we done? We've done more sort of um, how to get more information out of the GPS, which I hope is useful, and also out of the map while you're in mid-air, although it does mean pausing the flight, which is a little bit uh, unrealistic. Unrealistic, flight simulator, what? Remember, we get below 60, the plane falls out of the sky, so. Flaps increase drag, so you have to make sure you always put a little bit more throttle in. The whole thing is about um, managing. Now where's the runway gone? That's interesting. It's starting to struggle to stay in the sky because of the, um, of the slow speed. So it's flying nose up. Um, and you can see here we're below the glide slope. So we're in, a, we're in a, not a dangerous situation here but one from wh which we need to be aware of and recover. So I'm feeding in the throttle we're coming back on the glide slope, the speed is climbing and as we come back on the glide slope we should find that the nose um, goes down again. I'm going to have to wind the uh, seat up a bit as usual. And there we are, the nose is dropping again. You see how the plane's flying much more, much more happily now, yes? It's a little bit too fast now probably. But um, we, got, um, we got too slow there, didn't we, on the approach? lost track of the runway, lost the glide slope and if we hadn't taken action to recover from that um, could have been could have been very nasty because the autopilot while it is your friend <laughs> and saved our life in terms of finding the runway nearly killed us <laughs> by nearly stalling us on the approach although there is a stall warning which um, which does come in so probably better to come in fast rather than slow in this plane So also we've learned how to use a light switch to uh, illuminate the dials in the dark and we've learned how to use the ADF which is a very simple direction finder and in fact is, um, is of use. I'm going to throttle back and just disengage the autopilot by pressing um, Z. Um, pump 
part of the uh, procedure for landing at South End is to use that NDB. And perhaps if we do landing procedures um, next time, I'll, um, we, we may well use it again. So now I'm looking after the attitude of the plane now. And we can't see much about taxiing, but I'd imagine we'll be taxiing off to the right. So we'll just pop this on the ground. Not the best landing, but uh, certainly a short field landing and uh, in time to turn off. So, I haven't uh, really decided what we've got planned for next time, but then I didn't really um, decide what we were going to do this time until we took off. So <laughs> I'll, um, I'll see you next time.